Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Stone. I'm the Centennial Professor of Health Policy, and I direct the Center of Health Policy at the School of Nursing at Columbia University. Um, I want to welcome you to this uh, to this really exciting event, the Nurse State Legislatures, a briefing with Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long and Darlene Curley. We couldn't be prouder of the collaboration between Columbia Nursing and the University of Delaware School of Nursing and the Biden Institute that's made this event possible. Nurses' impact on a day-to-day -day patient care is undeniable. Today's discussion will remind us of the influence nurses can have in health policymaking and political advocacy. I'm now happy to introduce one of our co-sponsors, Elizabeth Speakman from the University of Delaware School of Nursing. Elizabeth. Yes, hi, thank you, Dr. Stone. So I am Dr. Elizabeth Speakman, and I'm the Senior Associate Dean, Chief Academic Officer at the University of Delaware School of Nursing and a proud alum of Columbia University. And I'm excited to be part of this collaboration between Columbia School of Nursing and the Biden Institute on this very important topic. Um, we think it's just important to be able to have these dialogues and we'll hope to get more people engaged in it. We also are very proud and very spoiled to have the Lieutenant Governor of the state of Delaware as a nursing faculty. So it's a huge opportunity for us to um, listen to what she has to say and to really be able to understand the real need of health policy and nursing and being able to make some of these decisions. So I'm also happy to introduce um, Dr. Catherine McLaughlin at the Biden Institute. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's great to be here with all of you today. Uh, the mission of the Institute, which is part of the Biden School at the university, and what we do really is to inspire the next generation to step up and get involved and to take on these important issues that President Biden has been working on his whole career. And obviously health care and health policy is a really important one. So we're excited to be part of this and we're excited to have to begin a relationship with all of you at the School of Nursing and with um, the, our colleagues down at the health center policy or health policy center. Um, my job now is just to pass this on to Pat Stone, who is the Centennial Professor of Health Policy and the Director of the Center of, um, at Columbia School of Nursing. I'm sorry. Um, and then no and I'm going to pass this on to Pat. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Catherine. No problem at all. I do want to thank uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, of Delaware, Dr. Bethany Hall Long and Darlene Curley for sharing their wisdom with us today. I'd also like to thank Ross Frommer for moderating today's event. During today's briefing, Dr. Bethany Hall and, Dar and Dr. Darlene Curley will speak to the nurses' current role in health policy and advocacy, as well as discuss how nurses can become more involved in policymaking and political action. After the briefing, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. So please use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen to ask our speakers questions, and we'll get to them at the end of the program. I now want to formally introduce our exceptional speakers. As of note, each speaker's full bio will be put in the chat so you can learn more about their incredible work and accomplishments. Bethany Hall Long was sworn in for the second time as Delaware's 26th Lieutenant Governor on January 19th, 2021. She is widely recognized nurse leader who uses her skills to bring people together, build consensus and help find common sense solutions to the issues facing Delaware families and communities. Bethany is leading the fight to make Delaware stronger and healthier and working nationally on critical public health and education is issues. Darlene Curley is a trusted health policy advisor to the state governors, U.S. senators, federal and state agencies, association executives, and a philanthropist to advance health for vulnerable populations. Since 2018, she's been advisor and adjunct professor here at uh, our Center for Health Policy at the School of Nursing a public policy consultant, board member, and volunteer for the Utah Medical Reserve Corps and the Governor's Commission on Aging. Our moderator, Ross Frommer, is a vice president for governor for government and community affairs and the associate dean at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. He represents the Medical Center on Legislation and Executive Branch Matters at the federal, state, and local le levels and assists with the development and implementation of programs surrounding the communities at our campus. He's also a faculty member of our School of Nursing. So, uh, Ross, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Well, well, thank you, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here. 
And I should note, we've been joined by Dr. Lorraine Frazier, the Dean of the Columbia University School of Nursing. It's a pleasure to have you here as well, uh, Lorraine. So uh, Dr. Curley, Dr. Harwong, let's just get right into it. Uh, as someone who's been involved in both nursing and advocacy, what do you see the role of nurse leaders in, in advocacy, health policy, politics, just the, the whole gamut? Uh, Darlene, could you start? Uh, thank you, Ross. I mean, nurses make excellent legislators. Um, we can assess data quickly, set priorities, collaborate, and solve problems. And it's, it's exciting to be talking about this today because state legislatures are now in session for a new term. And so it's an exciting time for those that are were elected in November. And also the 118th US Congress has just begun. So it's a perfect time for everyone listening to think about the exciting role of nurse leaders in policy. And also think about your own potential role as a candidate in 2024. Well, building off of what Darlene just said, uh, to not be repetitive, I think it's really important. You know, we've just come through and still are in the midst of a twin pandemic, COVID pandemic, the opioid epidemic, and never has it been more important that nurses, both the bedside, at the levels of research and scholarship, as well as administrative, recognize how we have to be at the policy table. You've heard it said before, and you'll hear me say it again today. If we're not at the table, we are on the menu. And nurses are the fabric, we are the glue of the healthcare system. And the common denominator is I chair the National Lieutenant Governors Association and Darlene and I have been together at a couple of forums at the, with the American nurses. And here today, thank you to Columbia, thank you to UD Nursing and Biden Institute for recognizing the major provider of health services in the United States, nurses must be involved and they have the best, as Darlene said, ability to advocate, they know how to use their two ears and one mouth to listen. And now after this session today, we're hopeful the other experts who are listening in, some who are already elected out there and others who are not, will think about either running for office or really getting engaged in their policy entities and their professional associations. And so advocacy matters. And as we improve quality access and cost in American healthcare, it starts with nurses. So. I'm thrilled to be here with Darlene to advocate for nurses in policy. You, you know, Governor, I'm glad, glad you brought up that quote by Senator Enzi. That's always been uh, one of my favorite. You know, you get you have to be at the table because otherwise the people making the decisions, they're gonna do it without you and they may not have your best interest in hand. I'll add one to it that I really like. Uh, for those of you who ever had, had to, fortunate enough to see the show Hamilton, it's about being in the room where it happens and uh, how important uh, that is. So I'm, I'm interested in learning more about your each of your journeys, if you will, from nursing to policy to advocacy to elected uh, to elected office. Um, could you talk about how you went, like I say, from being a nurse to being elected official, and uh, what are the challenges? What are the opportunities? Uh, Governor, we'll start with you this time. Sure, um, and uh, I think we'll hear some common denominators between Darlene and I, and I know we've got a couple other nurse electeds who are listening in with us today. You know, I think for most of us, it has to start with a fire in the belly and a reasoning to run. And, you know, just like Darlene, I have kept my clinical skills. I still teach full time at the university. I still have students out in the field. I gave 4,000 COVID vaccines myself, you know, last year, the Medical Reserve Corps. And I want to emphasize that because we are always nurses, not a former nurse, not just a nurse. We get rid of those adjectives. And, you know, what brought me to the dance was literally working with vulnerable populations. I was a graduate student, so students listening in, listen up, graduate student at the Medical University of South Carolina, saw how the persons I was taking care of in the black and brown community did not have a voice, particularly mentally ill homeless veterans. And thanks to a good mentor, so that's another thing for graduate students and nurses, hook up with mentors, Dr. Malloy and later Dr. Hazel Johnson Brown, uh, who helped me navigate why nurses needed to be in policy saw that without me writing letters, advocating, working with the League of Women Voters and others, we were not gonna get the resources necessary for shelter, for therapeutics, for pharmacy that these homeless mentally ill veterans needed. Later, and I'm gonna summarize this real quickly, took that journey to Washington DC, picked up the phone. So again, graduate students, doctoral students, nurses at the bedside, don't be shy, you, you've got a lot of courage. 
I picked up the phone and called and asked if I could be an intern. I was unpaid at first, but I had the opportunity to be an intern with Senators Dole, Cochran, and Kennedy, Republicans and Democrats, uh, as I was a student in a doctoral program at George Mason University. And through that lived experience, realized I actually like this stuff. And full confession, I was late to a class one day in my graduate program and got assigned that topic of policy and politics. And little did I know that I'd end up in the Mason text uh, book later on as a contributing author, but began to really see how if I wasn't really active, really engaged, that I wouldn't be able to help. Not everybody can run for office. You know, I moved to Delaware, became a faculty at UD, got engaged, began to run for office because they had asked for someone with a health background. And so became the first nurse elected as a legislator in Delaware. Later, mentoring, helping another nurse, uh, Dr. Walker, and now Representative Minor Brown. We have, you know, had a couple other nurses come along. So the moral of the story, don't think you can, because you can. Don't be afraid. Advocate for yourself, pick up the phone, get experiences, involve yourself in lobbying, government affairs, get involved with campaigns, and then pick the level for where you want to run. So I'll stop there because I love Darlene's story um, and her leadership also. And so for me, it culminated with six years in the House of Delaware, nine years in the state Senate, and then now I'm in my seventh year as lieutenant governor. So I guess, Darlene, it's your turn. Uh, thank you, Bethany. I just, I just love your story and really starting off with a fire in the belly to make things better and to improve the health, whether it's of your constituents, your state, your country, like you know that you can add value. So a uh, very similar sort of experience to the Lieutenant Governor. Also one thing that, that was very important is that in my community, a current state legislator called me and asked me to run. And the great thing is that they recognized that healthcare and business financial experience really was needed in the state legislature to make things better. So it really is a story for all of us to what is our journey? How can nurses really add value? But also if we're not running for office, think about someone that you know that you think would be great and identify them because that was really a turning point for me was when someone said, I think you'd be great and guess what, we need you. Half of our issues at the state level are health and healthcare finance. And we need people with that experience to improve things. So why don't you run and we'll support you? Thanks, Ross. Just as a follow-up, follow can you talk about your first race? What were your trepidations? What were you excited about? And how did it go? Uh, I'll just start. Uh, for my first race, um, I never run for office before. So starting with the state legislature um, was some people said, oh, you should do something different first. But I was ready. Um, I guess my big fear was that no one would vote for me, except I knew I'd get one vote and that was my own. Um, my family was not of the same political party. I didn't even think that my husband would vote for me, quite honestly. <laughs> So, I mean, but that's the reality. And also you have to understand that there's going to be signs all over your community with your name and it's probably your children's name as well. And how did they feel on the bus when they were driving by their name on a political sign? So once you sort of get through that, okay, I'll get one vote, but something wells up in you where you say, this is so important. I believe this is right. And whatever happens, there's always another way to engage and to make things better. Really good. I will add that when you run, not only have the fire in the belly, that you have to be willing to, like you said, see your name out there, willing to lose, willing to stand up and kind of pull your pants back up the next day and go on. I lost first time I ran, worked mm -hmm. my fanny off, you know, door to door and campaigning, raising money, which is often not the fun thing. I think Darlene would agree. But you have that passion. And for me, it really was, there was a lot going on in land use, because think of it, health care is health and all policy, right? 
whether it's environment, whether it's infrastructure, whether we're looking at uh, social justice, criminal justice. So it's not always directly the healthcare at the bid side, but it's those other social determinant health policies. I was driven by that because of land use and challenging issues. And also we didn't have an OSHA office in the state at the time. And so going out, the first door I knocked on, <laughs> somebody said, how nice are you helping your husband? <laughs> and so there were still some of those gender biases 20 years ago, which is a little different today, thank goodness. Um, and then I had some people say, well, your son must be neglected. He's four years old. How dare you? And I think once you can move beyond, most people, 98 to 8% are super supportive. They love nurses. They nurses are the number one profession in a Gallup poll. And I'm preaching to the choir today to the nurses and the health providers listening in. But I know getting your top three issues. And so I ran the first time, you know, wasn't successful. The very next day went right back to my community meetings. And the next time around was, again, during that time, got engaged, just like Darlene said, with other elected officials, worked my way, whether you're in a party system or structure, get to know your local community. If you don't want to run at the state level, look at your local, your county. And shoot, some of y'all should be going for Congress too, because it is a different time in America. And we really need nurses at every level of government. That's great. Um, so how has being a nurse uh, sort of impacted your role at public servants? There, there, there's a lot of public servants out there, hopefully most, if not all of them, you know, good intentions, uh, good background. What, what makes you as nurses different, special, better, whatever you want to call it? I'll start since I ended. You want me to start this time? Sure, sure. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I think nursing, again, number one trusted profession. People really trust us. And I saw that more than ever during COVID. When I was out door to door, COVID testing, working with families who are most needed. People know, one, we're respectful, we're in full of integrity. We put aside personal interest for the best good of the public utility. And we also are quick decision makers. Darlene and I both are part of the Medical Reserve Corps. You know, as clinical bedside nurses, you have to make life and death decisions in seconds. You have to triage. People know that that makes a good provider, a good clinician. And for the policy institutes here, Columbia and Biden Institute and UD Nursing here listening in, they know that sometimes good policy takes years. You know, it goes through a process. It's sausage making, the politics of committees and procedures. But also, you need someone who can leverage. And both Darlene and I have a skill set of working across the aisle. You know, we can bridge Republican, Democrat. We can work in divisive times to moderate and bridge and to come up with consensus. Nurses build consensus every day the bedside in their scholarship in their academic setting wherever they're working so that's my point of view <laughs> darlene anything to well, add to that about the, i think i think bethany covered it it's yeah. exactly right okay so bethany you talked about the importance of bipartisanship and policy making again you know we see this is an interesting time that we're in right now what are some of the strategies that nurse policymakers or frankly any policymaker can use to try to help uh, to achieve some sort of consensus on important policy initiatives that, that, initiatives that, that will in fact improve public health for everybody. You want to start with me again or Darlene? Uh, I want to let Darlene take this one. I apologize. Darlene, okay, no, that's, that's fine. I mean, I think for me, um, putting patient, family, and community health as priority one and if you start all of your conversation with your colleagues, regardless of party, everyone agrees that they want better health and better health care. And I would start, if I was uh, leading a conversation or negotiating a legislation, I would ask everyone in the room if they agree that we want better health and health care for everyone in our state and their constituents, raise your hand. Everyone raise their hand. I said, okay. Guess what? We all agree on this very important concept. It was like shaking sand off a blanket at the beach. I mean, everyone had a common ground. And then you could start talking about the issue. Um, I think the things, one thing I learned um, being a legislator was that it was okay to agree to disagree and have, and have great respect for everyone's opinion. Um, and being right was highly overrated. 
some people just wanted to be right. And in, in politics, we know, and that's usually who we hear about on the news, people on the left and people on the right who have to be right on their issue. But really the work is in the middle and that's where good legislation is formed. And nurses really understand that, that the family isn't always right. The patient might not be right. You've got physicians but we will come to some agreement to improve health and health care. And it works at all levels. Great. That is, that is a good consensus thing. I don't have a lot to add. And I'm thinking, Ross, when you probably worked with Senator Moynihan and others, you know, you saw that, um, you know, getting in the middle where people can agree. You know, we hear often, you know, during the opioid crisis and whatever the issues are, whether we're fighting over how to implement telehealth, how to create OSHA protections, how to do palliative care regulations or legislation, or advanced practice registered nurse independent practice. That's another one that we all have to go to bat to and lean in on. You know, it's it's in the middle. And what we're talking about are human issues, right? And we're talking about, um, you know, uh, bipartisan problems, right? You know, and, or you could flip it around and say, nonpartisan problems, bipartisan solutions, however you wanna flip it and phrase it. But it's where all people bleed red, where people need services. And when we get into those divisive issues, we in healthcare and nurses, whether it's about women's health, whether it's choice, whether we're talking about uh, second amendment rights, we as nurses know how to come at the lens where people can sit and have decent conversations, not throwing water bottles at each other, um, you know, but really getting down to work. And um, like, like Darlene said, a lot of times the media is out there instigating and I call the media the fourth branch of government. You know, you got the legislative, the executive, the judicial, the media sometimes I think has become the fourth branch. And so, you know, we'll get into that later maybe with some strategies and how nurses can influence the media. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that is a very important part of advocacy. And those of us who do government affairs certainly work with our colleagues and counterparts in media affairs uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, one more question before I take us into the next section. Uh, I imagine that both of you during your career uh, as policymakers have had some wins uh, and some losses. Um, you know, how do you describe success or failure and how do you sort of, uh, you know, celebrate success and how do you move on uh, from something which didn't go the way you wanted it to? <laughs> And uh, Bethany, if you wouldn't mind going first this time. Sure, sure, I'll start. Well, absolutely, the um, failure is the best lesson. And, uh, you know, as a new legislator, I think sometimes we go in with our eyes all open, just like a new novice nurse. You know, we go in, to, whether to the bedside or a new assistant professor, instructor, and faculty, and those who are listening in, you know, today, we go all in, and then we soon learn, you know, what is realistic and what isn't. And I think for me, um, you know, I've had wins and losses. I was lucky enough, you know, to have my chairmanships of health committees and environment and uh, agriculture. And, and I had a lot of policy areas where there was the opportunity to, uh, to work together. And it, to me, it wasn't measured so much in how many bills were passed, but really the quality form follows function. Like, what are we getting done? Sometimes you intentionally don't want legislation. You want things to go through the executive branch or regulatory or an executive order. And so for those listening in, you know, not everything has to be the sexy how a bill becomes law, not everything has to be state, not everything has to be federal, a lot of good things happen at county and local bureau, you know, local levels. And so for me, I was lucky to have assignments and topics that mattered. And I was, I had over a thousand bills I sponsored as a legislator. And there was a period of 15 years and probably 60% touched on healthcare. And again, it's really about the quality. And I could go on about some examples, uh, but you know, learning, but you know, you, you soon learn. It's just like kind of riding a bike and uh, you, you soon learn when to get the momentum and when not. And timing and relationships are really important. So that's all I'll say for now. Me, anything to add? Um, I think the only thing I would add for me, success was if you had um, bipartisan agreement on an issue. That was like the best success where everyone felt that their issues were heard and improvement was made for the health of their constituents or, or, or the state. Um, I think to me, a failure, 
for me personally was it wasn't if, if legislation that I was advancing didn't pass, if, if it was there was so much animosity that I wasn't able to move on to the next piece of legislation with that same group of people. Um, and that's where this agreeing to disagree sounds so trite, but it has to be where someone said, Darlene, I, you know, I admire you for bringing that forward. You understand I could never agree to that, but let's work on something else. That to me was the ultimate success. Walking out of a room and having people say, well, the next thing she brings up, I'm not working on that either. That is failure. So to me, it was about the relationships and the willingness to work on something, but also being very clear from the beginning, if it's something that you cannot support because of you represent your constituents and that's not their voice. Yeah. Understood, understood. I want to turn a slightly different direction because we've talked a lot about the importance of nursing, uh, nurses being involved in electoral politics and policy making. Uh, let's look at some of the numbers. And, and Darlene, I know you've done some research uh, in this field, could you just sort of update the, the audience of sort of where we are in terms of number of nurses uh, in state legislature um, and what the trend is? Just, you know, we, we talk about the importance. How many are there out there? Uh, thanks, Ross. So we um, put up a map of the number of nurse legislators currently serving right now. And in 2022, I completed an audit of nurse legislators by state uh, gathering information from 50 legislative websites, outreach to the American Nurse Association, state uh, associations, and policy leaders of professional nursing uh, associations. Um, and if any of you listening today, if you look at this map and you think that you might have more state legislators, um, please put it in the chat and let me know because this much of this was self-reporting of what states and state legislators uh, and the legislative websites would, would just define as their number of nurses. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be reading off my notes here. So I apologize for that, but um, we're also gonna post in the chat a link to the reports, two brief reports. Um, one is the audit of the 2020 to 22 nurse legislators by state and the current. If you, and if you wanna look at those. So, if you look at the map on the on the right, uh, on the bottom, there's a key. So um, in the dark green are states with three to six nurse legislators. And uh, in the medium green, the states that have two nurse legislators, light green is one. And white are states with zero nurse legislators. Um, so, some overall facts, we have currently 68 nurse legislators serving in 34 states. Again, this is all in the reports on the American Nurse Association website. Of the 68, 15 are state senators and 53 are representatives or delegates. 32 are Democrats, 36 are Republicans. And we have 16 states uh, that lack nurse legislators. And there was California, Florida, Hawaii, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, Maryland, Michigan, Nebraska, Nevada, New Mexico, South Carolina, Tennessee, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. And um, I know some of you in the chat are saying we do have a staff representative. If you could please put the name in the chat room, I would love that because we really want a complete list. So thank you for some of you for mentioning that. But we also had some really good news um, in the November election for those currently serving. Um, we had 43 states where nurse candidates were on the primary or general election ballot. And former Wisconsin State Rep Sarah Rodriguez was elected Lieutenant Governor, joining our wonderful colleague, uh, Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall Long today, who's with us. Um, at the federal level, we had three nurses um, elected to Congress. So this is a great map for you to look at. And clearly uh, our work is ahead of us with all of these states that don't have a nurse legislator right now. So um, let's look over the, uh, quickly look at the trend over time. We're gonna put up a bar graph of what's happened in the last 10 years, comparing 2013 to 2023. And on the X axis, we have the states in alphabetical order. And the Y is the number of state nurse legislators. Orange is 2013. 
and blue represents 2023. So as you can see, um, our numbers have dropped off significantly from the number of nurse legislators serving in states from 2013 to 2023. Um, in 2013, there were 97 state nurse legislators, and today there are 68. It's a 30% drop. In 2013, we had legislators, nurses as legislators in 39 states. Today, 34. It's a 13% drop. Um, and although not on the bar graph, in 2015, there were six nurses serving in Congress, and today there are three. So we can talk about the implications of this and the call for action, I think, in our next, um, in our next segment. Okay, that's um, great. But for all of you looking at, go ahead, Ross. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I go, please, please finish. No, I'm, no, I'm done, that's, okay. that's it. Thank so, you. So Darlene, if you wouldn't mind, if we can go back to the previous slide, because I'd like to, yeah. first of all, yay, Maine. Uh, they're, they're, uh, if I'm reading right, they're in first place. And for those of you out there in Michigan, Illinois, Florida, Mexico, California, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you got a lot of work to do, get at it. Uh, but I would, would like to mention one thing. Um, state legislatures can have different number of members. There are some uh, state legislatures that are very large. Uh, New Hampshire Assembly is the second largest legislative body in the, in the country. Uh, I can't remember, but California, as I recall, is very small, but it's much smaller than you think it would be for a size uh, for a state. So there, there are not uniform uh, numbers of legislators in each state. I'll also mention, just because there are any sort of good political geeks on the um, on this, we have 49 bicameral legislators, legislatures, and then Nebraska is what we call a unicameral legislature. Mm -hmm. There is no, there's only one uh, assembly or senate, right. I forget what they call it, but there's not two. So that just uh, throw that. Um, well, and you'll also note, yeah, you're right, Ross, and you'll notice it from this that, um, you know, there are over, there are over 7,500 uh, legislators serving in the country, and 68 are registered nurses. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, you know, some of the states with no nurse uh, legislators are those with the largest population. California, right, yeah. as you mentioned, Florida. Uh, Florida, Michigan, Michigan, Florida. Washington, I see. Yeah. Right. And my home state, Maine, um, ha where I served, has one of the smallest populations, yet there are six nurse legislators. Uh, I think because someone said a good example. Uh, so, <laughs> First hey, Darlene, I what was the total number again? Can you say that number? I want people to really hear that. How many there, there are seven, there are uh, over 7,600 legislators in the country. And there are 68 nurses right now. So, so less than one percent. Less than one percent. Right. And we and previously we had almost a hundred. Mm -hmm. so the number has been going down over the last decade. When everything that you talked about, Bethany, nurses being the most trusted on the front lines of COVID, like it doesn't uh, it doesn't make sense when we need so many nurses at the policy level. And and so you know this is the time, right? We want to reset that conversation. Yep. So just a couple more questions before we get into uh, Q and A from our audience. I see we do have some some Q uh, Q and A's uh, lined um, up. Uh, what can existing nurse leaders do? Uh, to get more people, more nurses involved in policy, encourage uh, nurses and people involved in health policy to, to throw their hat in the ring. Um, um, I'll jump in real quick here. I yeah. think that's why I emphasized Darlene. I said, say that number again, Darlene, because I think for people to hear that, folks, everything that affects us personally, when we're taking care of patients, when we're in school with students, when we're nurse scholars, uh, when we're managers, when we're nurse attorneys, nurse anesthetists, whatever our titles are, everything, all of our clinical practice, our reimbursement levels, which have been under attack a lot, particularly for advanced practice registered nurses, our autonomy, who we delegate to with our nurse practice acts, all are dependent on having a voice at the table. One of the former nurse legislators, Dr. Walker, 
in the state of Delaware, I convinced her to run. She'd been the board of nursing president in our state. She knew the laws. And then we had some challenges. And working with a doctoral student, Dr. Ron Costato, we worked to change independent practice in the state. And then Representative Minor Brown, who's in there now, who works also at the university with me as a colleague, um, has taken it to the next level. Those changes just didn't happen in our small state without intention, without focus, without advocacy, without people. And so nursing organizations, getting behind candidates, you know, not only supporting them monetarily, but helping with their uh, rollout, their platforms, getting nurses internships, getting nurses the opportunity, whether in the hospital, the academic setting, whether they're in a correctional facility, a home health agency, a long-term care facility, to be engaged in professional associations and societies, to begin to understand that the rubber hits the road Again, if you're not at the table, and the only way to be at the table is to be part of policy. And it doesn't mean everybody listening in is going to run for office. We certainly hope some of you do, but maybe some of you are really committed to maternal child health policy. Maybe you're committed to LGBTQ policy. Maybe it's the environment. Whatever is motivating you, things don't just change without momentum and assistance. So think about what drives you and your passion. And so for each of the settings, and as we have the institutes from the Biden and the Columbia Health Policy Centers, knowing that those data that are there, fighting for the Title VIII and NEA funds that are Title X funds that are available really makes a difference for scholarship. Because I know Darlene, when you were at Jonas, you know, you were constantly, you know, fighting to make sure we had funding for nurses so that we can address the nurse shortage, which is the real, real 800 pound gorilla that faces us. Darlene, anything to add on that? Yeah, I think as a profession, um, we need to say that this is a problem and we're going to fix it. Um, so many of us and so many people listening are saying, this is not right. We need nurse legislators in every state. Well, if everybody says that across the country and all the professional organizations agree, we can fix this. We have, we've done a great campaign on getting nurses on boards. We could do the same thing, a call to action to get nurses in state legislatures. And the, I mean, so many professional organizations have state associations and they have really outstanding members that would be fantastic legislators. And now is the time to think about recruiting candidates for 2024. And having that be, whether you have that, we have to say that that is a priority because if it is a priority, we can fix this together. Darlene, do you see a role for the nursing associations um, in this and encouraging some of their members to get more involved on a bipartisan or nonpartisan way, but how, what, what, how can they step up, if you will? Oh, yeah, I, I think by, and some of them actually are doing this. I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of great momentum going on. Um, for example, um, healing politics um, and we're going to put their website in the chat. They are holding a campaign school um, for nurses who want to run for office. And that is, is like very exciting. But at the state level, you know, they all the professional associations have government affairs and policy committees. And that's where this conversation is. Like we are going to recruit candidates and we're going to look around and say, okay, who wants to run? you're great, you would be great, you're a great leader too, policy leader. Let's move people up and support them. So I, I think it really, because we're talking primarily about states and also, but that's also where congressional candidates come from. It's really the place for grassroots effort to recruit nurse candidates and support them. Great. And it's not as hard as people think. If you could be a nurse, <laughs> clinician, Administrator, you can be elected. Uh, you have all the skill sets. You are ready on day one. You are absolutely, positively, you know, absolutely ready. And as you indicated, the nurses in politics, you know, nursing and healing. For, for, I mean, there's so many opportunities. The one topic that I think too that needs to be addressed in addition to the shortage is our diversity in healthcare. You know, equity is such an important thing. Our black and brown communities across America, uh, the numbers are increasing. We want to make sure also that we have representativeness in that same arena. So as we're getting candidates, uh, you know, we want to be laser focused, also intentional uh, to make sure whether it's a male nurse, uh, black and brown community nurse leader, uh, like my colleague, Representative Minor Brown, who's done an incredible job in the Black Caucus. She's become Delaware's first um, minority whip, um, not majority whip 
um, in the house. I used to be in the minority when I was in the house. Now the house is on the other side. So she's now the majority whip. Um, and it's intentional. And so I think the more we can focus, work with associations, work in academia, that we can lower that gap um, and make sure nurses are at the table. So uh, that's a, a good point, I think, to segue into some, some of our audience questions, because one of the questions I noticed uh, in the chat, and Pat, I'm going to need some help because there, there are a lot of questions in the chat, um, uh, was this question about uh, diversity among nurse elected officials. We all know that, uh, I should say, a lot of us have followed the career of Congresswoman Laura Underwood, uh, someone who has a true distinguished career in academic nursing, has also been a member of Congress in Illinois, I think in her third or fourth term, I can't remember exactly. So Darlene, among the nurses that you looked at, do you have any breakdown by gender, ethnicity, other, uh, uh, other categories? Uh, and then, you know, how do we make sure that that number, and we want to see it grow, is also a diverse group as well? Yeah, I, I did not uh, look at that, Ross, in my research. And I think uh, for all research is one of our one of our areas that we want to talk about is what can researchers do in this area? And one is to look at all of those kinds of issues, diversity um, of candidates. But we also need to think about diversity of thought. Um, and I know when I talked to some state associations, they said, well, we don't really talk to that nurse legislator because um, we don't agree with where they stand on issues. But we have to remember we're a divided country politically. And so we're going to have people of, of all political thought. And we need to think about that as part of our part of our diversity. But again, at the state associations, they are doing such a great job on diversity and equity. And I think this follows it to recruitment of candidates as well. So I think I think um, the the groundwork is laid at the state nursing associations to increase diversity and equity, and it's top of mind. And now is the perfect time to be recruiting candidates that reflect that that mindset. And so, uh, Ross, yeah. I want to bring a question that I sure. think that um, uh, Lavidia Owens asks is. Why do you think there's been such a drop in the numbers of nurse legislatures? Is it because of difficulties with male colleagues? Um, is it, you know, many nurses are female and the time away from home? Uh, any sort of thoughts? And they also say that they're very proud of you, Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> Elevating. <laughs> but any, any thoughts of the reasons for the drop in, in nurse state legislatures? Charlene, I'll let you start since that's very focused on if I don't know if you could hear her, the drop, why it's harder. I'll I did. Um, I have my uh, anecdotal gut feeling. You probably Yeah, I, I mean, you know, some research studies say it's pay has been an issue. Um, there are three levels of pay for state legislatures. Um, some states pay up to $120,000 salary. I know Maine um, pays $18,000 over two years. So you have to find another way to support yourself. I think that it is intentionality and focus on nurses running for office. Um, I know when I was running, there was a, a discussion um, about nurses running for office and how important that was and support from the nursing association. And I think now there, when I've talked to state association folks, they have so many issues that they're dealing with that this has lost its focus. But Bethany, I don't know what you've seen and heard and if that rings true to you. You know, I think, you know, between that, the twin demics and uh, just the life shift focus, you know, and the clinical side and the real burnout, you know, the real existing challenges within our shortage that was happening regardless. But I do think conversations and leadership by Columbia University, the Biden Institute, UD today, it really says to America and to those listening across the country. And my good friend, Levada Owens White, who is a miracle worker on the street, who is a minority nurse leader in the state NAACP champion national leader, was hired as a parish nurse by the state's hot, largest health system. Think about that. Um, you know, and that's where I think the rubber hits the road. 
us being intentional, working in communities, whether our divine nine sororities, whether we're working uh, with our faith leaders, community leaders, hospital systems, really um, encouraging and not only encouraging nurse persons to join the nursing profession, but having these forums. And to everyone listening in, Darlene and I can be mentors. Now we can't do all 200 people overnight, but you know, don't be shy. You know, we can put you in touch with people. You get up with Darlene, if you're listening in from Illinois, we can put you in with a nurse there. We have the ability, folks, on this network of 200 today to really change by even the year 24, the next election cycle, which I know is really important to me, but also important to others. And so it has to be intentional. So I hope after today, Darlene, we have some type of perhaps follow-up, but for those listening in, get to know your leaders, join your associations. And again, I don't mean to be speaking down if you already are a national NIH funded nurse scholar, what implications from your research can you now use to influence policy in your state? Simple one pager, simple email, pick up the phone, influence the policy in your state. And I think too that there's a there's so much um, uh, perceived or real divisiveness in the political arena right now that when I reach out to nurses or they reach out to me, the first question is, I'm not sure I can put up with that uh, divisiveness, name calling, all of those kinds of things. And um, I, I, I think it's keeping great people from running. So what I do is connect them with their local political party, whatever it is. That, that's It doesn't matter to me. I just want to get them to the right place and have them talk through those kinds of issues because sometimes what you think I think people would be surprised at the state level that almost 90% of all legislation is agreed upon, either to pass it or to kill it. And what is on the edges is what we hear about. And I, I think if uh, potential candidates reach out to their political party at their local level and have these conversations and share what they're thinking and say, I'm interested, I don't know what to do next, what do I do? Um, you know, How do I find out more information? they will be very positively surprised and feel supported to run for office. So before I get to the next question, I should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, Darlene mentioned that there are three current le nurse legislators from New York. As a lot of some of the lobbies in New York, I thought I should mention them, just so everybody knows. It's uh, Assemblywoman Aileen Gunther from up in the Catskills, Assemblywoman Karinas Reyes from uh, the Bronx, and Assemblywoman uh, Farah Sufran Forrest from uh, Brooklyn. We had an interesting question. Uh, again, uh, are there times where your role as a healthcare expert, as a nurse, conflicts with your role as a representative of the, of the people you represent? When the data shows you one thing and in your heart of hearts, you know one thing is right, but the polling data and your town halls clearly show that the, your constituents don't agree with you. Uh, how do you handle those types of issues as a healthcare professional and an elected official? I, I, and I promised I was not going to throw only softball, so I think I've met that one here. I mean, I can jump in. Um, yeah. my, my test should be everybody's test. What can you comfortably put your head on the pillow at night with? Um, what can you be comfortable with? And if we are in a representative democracy. And when you are elected, you are elected to represent the folks that elect you. And uh, my very first six months in office, I lived through a difficult time when Delaware was going to be the second state in the nation under Governor Mitter, then the first female governor of Delaware, um, the last female governor we've had to date. And she um, went with the smoking ban. And I had a district that loved smoking, had casinos, had bars. You know, and it was a challenge and, you know, working through amendments and having things at night, you had to be able to put your head on the pillow. The great thing is, as Darlene indicated, unlike what you see on TV, what you see in the social media, most of the policy work that is accomplished is done collaboratively across the table in conversation. And so there are less of those and more of my going to bed at night with my, you know, head on the pillow and um, making sure things are done right. And to some of the questions that have come up, you know, in the chat, you know, um, as you're dealing with these tough questions and issues, you can be writing op-eds, you can be doing advocacy work, and you can be using clinical data. And I think, 
if you use some of the clinical research data, patient client data, and it's real and you hear from real people and it's validated, that always helped to ease my conflicts. And I don't know, Darlene, if yours were similar or different. <laughs> Now, it, you described you described the conflict um, perfectly, and I would just say, you know, I, my constituents who elected me, um, we were I was in the minority, but there, I wanted my constituents to never feel like they were in the minority just because I was in the minority party. Their issues were number one to me. But twice a month, I held office hours on Saturday at the local library. And it was sort of open door and people would just come in and share what their issues were. Or if people were calling me about, I don't agree what you said, I saw this in the newspaper and I would say, please come in and talk to me. And they would come in and that really, as long as I communicated with my constituents, uh, I mean, you represented everyone in, in your district. You just didn't represent your party. You represented everybody. And as long as I communicated with them how I was going to vote on something and they weren't surprised, um, it, it really, they understood that I was making the best decision and that's what I was elected to do. But it was really this open door of communication um, with my community and my district that got, got us through those bumpy patches and not everyone agreed, no matter what you, however you vote, almost half the people are going to disagree with you. And you have to say, as Bethany said, what is the best thing based on the data and the health of my community and the health of my state to make this decision? You know, and I've worked, never been an elected official, but I've worked for a lot of elected officials. It's, it's really one of the few jobs where you have to be willing to lose your job in order to do it well. Uh, and that there is, a, there is a dichotomy about what you, what you think is best and what your constituents do. Uh, I, I will let, Folks know we've had one person already chime in, a uh, uh, participant from California, very disappointed that there are no nurses in California and she's thinking about running. Uh, so uh, maybe I'm putting a little bit too much pressure on her. I won't mention her name just to- uh, That's great. But, um, uh, any thoughts, any advice to her, you know, as someone who's gonna dip her toe in the water? I would say start in with one of the associations or affiliations uh, you know, today, this is nonpartisan, but obviously in California, probably being aligned with the local party is going to be supportive. So get engaged in your local committee and uh, begin looking at, uh, you know, linking up not only with one of us here, but we can put you in touch with some other folks, you know, in California. But again, knowing the issues, knowing what drives you, uh, obviously for you to put yourself out and put yourself in the chat, there's got to be something that is inspiring you. Uh, to consider drive to run. And uh, there'll be good and bad days. And, you know, we can have maybe another forum another time specific to folks when we do or the healing politics, sign up for a session with nurses, uh, nurse program uh, for campaigning and can get kind of in the specific details of uh, the nitty gritty of campaigning. But trust me, you're a nurse and you can run for office. Uh, the first thing I did was talk to my family and friends and said, I've been thinking about this. I know I do a good job, but like, give me fee. I, I tried to get feedback from people who cared about me and have them say, yes, you'd be great. Or, you know, what your family would say about it, because it really, it, it, uh, everyone is, everyone is affected by it. So you really need your, to have those conversations. And then I went to my, um, town political meeting and just attended and then met with those folks and said, I am interested in running. And someone already reached out to me and asked me to run. So they sort of, they shepherded me through this process of the political process um, and said they would help me raise money, which was my big issue. I said, well, I need to raise a lot of money um, to, to run for the legislature. And then I also uh, was invited to and won the primary to run for Congress um, in my state. I did not win that race, but that required a lot of fundraising also. So that is a big part of what's required, but your party will help you raise money. You know, you're not on your own out there. So for, I've seen several other people say they're interested in running, talk to your family, reach out to your political party locally, talk to some folks and, and make a list of those questions that you have. Um, and you'll want you, and, and it's much better than staying home saying, oh, I think I should run. I want to know. I'd be really great. I do such a, you know, I would do so much. 
I would do such a better job than the people that are running right now. I am, I could do better than them. Um, if you have any of those feelings, go get some information, find out about it. It may not be that today is your day to run, but if you have the information when there's an open seat or it may be in two or four years, the, the time will be right, but you need to start thinking about it now. It's, it's very, it's, it, the time is now. So I'm so excited. I've seen several people pop up and say they're interested in, in running. So that's great. And each state has a little different campaign finance laws too, right. like some states, how you raise your funds and how you don't raise your money. And, uh, you know, nurses are the largest health provider in every state and every district and community. Um, so you'll start, you'll start with a base and you'll have all kinds of topics. I just need some great conversations, Darlene. Oh my gosh, we're talking about entry <laughs> level licensure. We have talked about access. We talked about community health, population health. Y'all are on fire with topics that are important. And that's why we need nurses in policy to help us navigate the health system. The health system will crumble without nurses and who better to make policy for themselves than nurses. So a uh, final question before we wrap it up, and we have a couple of nursing school deans on the line with us today. So uh, one of our uh, attendees asked, how can nursing education programs uh, incorporate these opportunities in the curriculum? How can they talk about policy and politics in the curriculum? And, and full disclosure, the, the, the teaching that I do at Columbia is about policy and politics. Well, the essentials for, um, baccalaureate and uh, DMP education require policy courses. So in, if you're teaching a policy course, have uh, policy leaders, past and current legislators speak to your students, um, involve them in internships. I know for Bethany and for myself, those were two really important steps for us to run for office was having internships in Washington. Um, um, and also make sure that the students um, write policy papers or policy briefs about current issues that are burning for them where they can make a difference. Um, and I think for me, those are three things that educators can be doing um, for students. Now, Bethany, I'm sure you have some things to add to that. No, I think it's great. I think our Dean Lorraine, I think she's joined us too from Columbia, like you stated. There is so um, much that we could do. Curricula um, are really important. And even at the undergraduate level, and for those of you in the associates, um, you know, all levels across the compendium, um, it's important to be aware. Because again, if you're not engaged in the community and involved in the work, and it doesn't have to be academics, you don't have to have a PhD after your name to be engaged in, you know, policy, but it's really important to learn, you know, in the education setting, you know, you learn together kind of in the sandbox collectively, nurses, doctors, health providers, we need to have that same integration and understanding in policy. Susan Connady Buck, who's with our nurses, uh, nurse practitioners here in Delaware wrote, you know, talk about the importance of boards and commissions. I think part of the nursing curricula, undergrad and graduate should encourage, give credit to students who go to these meetings. Faculty, you know, we're, we're rated on service instead of just scholarship and teaching always really up the ante, that service does matter and service in policy matters. And so I think looking at how we formulate uh, both academics, healthcare at the bedside and scholarship is important. So I thank you for this opportunity. I know our time is probably wrapping out and I see our Dean's faces coming back on, but uh, it's it's been a thrill and I hope folks reach out to us. So uh, um, Dean Frazier, just would you like to make a couple of remarks? I know you weren't here at the beginning, just very briefly if you can. I apologize for that. Much, much, much rather close it though after hearing all this amazing uh, program. It was wonderful. I wish we had taped it, really. I would listen to it again, for sure. We, we, we have taped it, I think. When I, read, when I read these tidbits, you know, work isn't done in the middle. Build consensus. Timing and relationships are very important. Agree to disagree. These are all life lessons, right? And lessons for everything that we do. But, oh boy, do we need to organize on the state level. I cannot Thank you enough for this amazing presentation. It's been such an honor to be here. Darlene and Bethany, thank you. Patricia, Pat, thank you for organizing this. Ross, thank you for um, uh, being the uh, moderator. It was 
Absolutely amazing. And thank you for those Dean's questions. They were very important. <laughs> yeah, your Bynum Institute and uh, UD uh, Nursing. I know all of you. What a great thing. So I think we've got some work to do and a follow-up coming. Yes, <laughs> we absolutely do. Well, that's great. So I certainly want to thank everybody, especially our, our, our two guests, yes. Dr. Darlene Curley, uh, Curley uh, Dr. Bethany Hall-Long, also Lieutenant Governor Bethany Hall-Long. And with that, I guess, Pat, I'm supposed to send, send it back to you for the final comments. Yeah, I, ju I just wanted to um, uh, thank everybody again, uh, especially the Biden Institute and the University of Delaware for partnering with this because I think it really made for a very rich. I want to thank our participants who, from what I can see, uh, the audience was national. You know, we had people from California, from, from lots of different places. We'll try to get to your to your questions. We tried to get to as many as we could. Um, and this will be recorded. We'll send out the link for the recording so people can share. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. We'll see you soon. One more nursing name. So when Darlene and I come back, more numbers on that map. That's right. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Have a good day, everybody. Yep, thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye.